The next morning, after a better breakfast than we usually had at home, we started for the freight yards. We had money enough left for streetcar fare, and so after some inquiries, we found the right car and rode out to the yards in style. We weren't too much concerned about money. We thought we'd ride as far as we could on the freight train. Then Howie and Joey could repeat their panhandling stunt, and we could eat until a real job could be located. We had the remainder of the loaf of bread we bought the night before. That would, have do, that would have to do for us for the train ride. We found acres of tracks down in the freight yards. I had never known there were so many. We saw trains coming in and leaving, trains being loaded for a run, trains backing, lurching forward, switching. Everything was confusion. Adding to that confusion was an army of men, many of them railroad workers, just as many others were loiterers like us. These men were looking around, sizing up the cars and their loads, waiting for the whistles that meant a train was about to start. When the signal came, they would run to leap into a car or swing up on an outer ladder and climb to the top of the train once the wheels had picked up speed. I asked a cautious question or two whenever I saw a face that looked friendly. There wasn't many such. Men's faces seemed to be much alike that year, lean, scowling, and angry. One man who told me that he'd been a hobo for 15 years was friendly enough. However, and was willing to talk to us. When we told him we were headed west, he didn't question the vagueness of our west, but pointed out a train and told us it would leave for Iowa that afternoon. We'd get to Nebraska the next morning. That sounded good to us. That was west and far away from Chicago. I asked the hobo about the railroad detectives, the bulls of whom I'd heard a lot. Were they really brutal as many of the newspapers and magazine articles described them? Sometimes they were, he told me, especially when the higher-ups began to put on the pressure and a bull felt his job was in danger. He had seen bulls club men off the train. He'd also seen an angry group of free riders seize a bull and throw him from the train. On the other hand, he'd seen riders and bulls sit together for long hours, chatting or playing cards as if everything were all above board and just fine. It all depended, he said. It all depended on your luck. I asked about the dangers. Yes, he'd seen kids, men too, but mostly kids, get killed if they were careless. Big loads of lumber or steel might shift with a sudden lurch of the train and crush an unwary, unweary rider. Some people misjudged the speed of a train and made their grabs for the ladder or the open car too late. Legs were often crushed in accidents of that sort. A feeling of uneasiness chilled me, uneasiness especially for Joey. He was thin, even too skinniness, and he wasn't as active as most kids his age. He hadn't grown up accustomed to the leaping and climbing and bike riding that I had done as a youngster. He'd had too many years of illness for that. Howie was slender, too, and short, but he was an agile little guy who had survived Chicago's traffic and some of its worst slums. Howie could keep up with me, I was pretty sure, but I was worried about Joey. I decided against waiting until the freight started. We'd find an open car and hide until we were on our way. If the bulls discovered us and threw us off before we got moving, we'd just have to find another train. I couldn't see Joey undertaking a scramble that was dangerous, even for men who had jumped on moving trains for years. Howie agreed with me. We found an open car filled with big sacks of lime, which farmers used to fertilize their fields. There were some fairly good hiding places among these piles. Fairly good, that is, if a railroad bull happened to be lax in his car inspection. And, of course, that all depended on your luck. We jumped inside when we felt no one was watching, and in the hour of waiting for the train to start, not a soul came near us. We got to feeling pretty confident after a while, almost as if we had bought tickets for a ride somewhere out west. Three men jumped into our car when the train began to pick up speed, but they didn't pay any attention to us. They looked very blue and tired. They didn't even talk to one another. We rattled out of Chicago, and in an hour or two, we were passing farms and small towns, the fields brown with with withered corn stalks, looked ghostly as twilight closed in. We crossed rivers, most of them low and sluggish after the drought that had burned things up that summer. And then finally, we were rushing through nothing but black night with only the light from the engine, at least a mile ahead of our car, to, to cut the darkness. Talk <clears throat> lagged that night. All three of us were quiet, a little thoughtful. Once Howie stroked the strings of his banjo a few times, but somehow the chords sounded mournful. I felt as if I couldn't stand to hear them, and I was glad when he shook his head and laid the banjo aside. Joey had charge of the leftover bread. He took it out after a while, and we cut it up into chunks with Howie's knife. We ate it very slowly, chewing each bite a long time to stretch out the experience of having food in our mouths. Joey finished first, and Howie handed him a crust from his own share. Here, Joey, you eat this. I hate the crusty part. He lied indifferently. 
That was like Hallie.